is Terry Bradshaw, quarterback, Pittsburgh Steelers. At 7.15, there's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. This is baseball, Major League Baseball. And this is ABC's Mel Allen. Monday Night Baseball, live from Fenway Park in Boston, Ready, Massachusetts. Looking, 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 he's under the gun. He's fired, he throws. It is. Welcome one and welcome all to the Past Our Prime podcast. You know, one of the reasons we started this podcast was because of guys like the recently deceased Bill Walton. Mm -hmm. As we get further and further away from when these players like Walton and David Thompson and Dr. J and Hank Aaron, Gordie Howe, Muhammad Ali, as we get further away from what they did, it's harder for many of us, especially those who didn't get to see them on a daily basis, well, no one got to see him on a daily basis back then. Mm-hmm. It's just harder to remember just how great they were and what an impact they had. But that's what we're here for. It's mm-hmm. kind of a it's I kind of tell people it's like a sports history lesson for me and I assume for my two partners, Bill Mahoney, Mark Hoffman. What about you guys? Uh how each each issue we I learned something new. Yeah, it's like going to the library and checking out a book, like you go into the history section, you know, and um, it's it brings back so many memories for me. And again, when we're looking back 50 years, there's a mortality factor, you know, people are either passed or are about to pass or someone like Bill Walton, you lose while you're doing this, this podcast. And uh, it, it just talks to you about your own mortality and the frailty of life and, you know, enjoying every moment you have, which I know Bill does. There's not a day that goes by that Bill doesn't enjoy. Well, and that was doing. certainly true with Bill Walton as well. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. So it sure was. I just remember the, uh, I don't think it's a lot. I mean, I followed these guys as a young guy. But what it does is expands on the knowledge, the little knowledge that I had. You know, I knew Bill Walton a little bit at UCLA, mainly when he was with Portland. But you pick up more for who he is as a person. He becomes more, because I'm an adult, he now becomes more of a, uh, 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 not just a legend, but a man, everything he was able to do and accomplish and the person that he was. That's what I enjoy about doing the show, not just Bill Walton per se, all of the people. Well, the, the thing is too, and I think this probably holds true for all of us having been around athletes for basically our entire adult lives is what these guys end up doing on the court. I, I I've LeBron, Michael Jordan, Magic. I've seen the greats, right? I don't really care what they do on the court. Mm-hmm. I care who, like, about the character of the person, how they are uh, dealing with that fame. Do they give back to the community? Those kind of things. Do they make their lives of the people around them better? And for Bill Walton, from what I have read and seen, that was the case. People loved to be in his presence because he was this, as he would say, he would shine the light. Yeah, I, I remember, um, if I can tell the story, I remember when, um, Scott, maybe a couple of years, a few years ago, you got me that. You said, oh, the White Sox want us to go down to Anaheim and shoot something with Bill Walton. He was going to give the team a speech. So I get down there. And for me, Bill Walton was always a childhood legend. I was a young guy. I got in a car wreck. I couldn't move. My head was was in pain all the time. And so I listened to him play against Kareem and he was just so dominant. So the opportunity to go down to Anaheim and and be around him. And the thing is, he was literally the Pied Piper. He walked into Anaheim, kids and adults were all behind him and he's laughing, going, let's sing happy birthday. How's everyone doing? What a beautiful day. He goes into the clubhouse and the players and the coaches out of nowhere when Bill Walton walked in, shut up. There was not a sound to be made. He talked for about 40 minutes. And then he goes out on the field. Players from both teams, Angels and and White Sox, all surrounding him, trying to get his autograph. Kids coming up. He became an even bigger legend to me. Not because of, like you said, what he did on the court. How he treated everybody, every kid. Even me, I asked a dumb question about the Grateful Dead. He was so 
kind and so nice and so fun. That's what you take from these people. Not what he, not the dunks and whatever he did, just everything that he meant to others and how kind he was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't have a lot of um, contact with Walton. I remember the, uh, I was covering the 1990 NBA finals and I was in Portland and it was between the Blazers and Pistons and Walton was sitting at the table, the media table where I was eating and stuff like that. But, um, to me, the, the memories of Walton that really stick with me, I remember him obviously at UCLA so well in that game against Memphis in the championship game in 73 when he hit 21 out of 22 shots, 44 points, to me the most dominant performance of any player. And then something off the court. So when Walton played at UCLA, uh, Wooden was, you know, conservative and stuff, and Walton was kind of free spirit. And I think he even said, Coach, I'm going to grow my hair out or something to that effect, and uh, I need to do that. I, I can't play unless I, I can be me. And I think Wooden said something to the effect of, well, it would have been nice having you on the team or something like that, you know, because it's going to be my <laughs> way or not. So they butted heads a bit, but there's a picture in later years where, where Wooden is on the court with Walton, and he's giving Bill the biggest hug you've ever seen. And it was kind of like, you know, the um, the kid that always is a headache to the parent, but then in later years is the most loving kid Loyal. to that parent yeah. and stuff like that. And that's uh, that Walton-Wooden um, relationship I saw. But, I mean, those are the ones that stick out most to me about Bill. Now, so didn't you, you had reached out to... Um... Gerald Willett, and yeah. didn't he a really nice thing he wrote back? And I always thought, wouldn't it have been neat, because he had talked about it, it would have been neat to get Bill and I together. Yeah. We're just thinking back, not for us publicity-wise, just to, what if we had been able to get Bill yeah. and him on the same show? Because they, they, batted, they butted heads, right. not just in college, but possibly, you know, when he was trying to go to Portland, I'm talking about Willett. It would have been amazing. But you could tell, even what he wrote you, that Willett had just the most amazing amount of respect and maybe is adulation wrong no, for no, the man? No. So yeah. I just Gerald Willett was the center for the Oregon Ducks that yeah. beat UCLA in the '74 season. You know when they lost, whoever beat them ended up on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but he said he and Bill didn't necessarily get along at points of their career, both in in college and the NBA. But when we had Gerald on the show. Bill mm. said, you know, you guys seem like you're cut from the same cloth. And Gerald was like, oh, yeah, we'd get along great now. I'm sure we yeah. would. And and we had, you know, started little trying to see if we could make that happen at some point. And, mm. and it just wasn't. Because we were so. getting close. Didn't Bill Walton had said he would maybe do our show In the after the season. You're right. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I'm just saying, what was, but, what you was know, your you... guys' first reaction when you read it, when you read that Bill Walton had passed? I was shocked. Just shocked. He's only 71. Full of life at last, you know, basketball season ends two months ago and I had, you know, no inkling. Yeah, I know I did too. And I could have sworn he had just done a, a commentary on a Pac-12 game, but maybe he had missed the last few and I just didn't realize it. But I was just so used to having him there. And then when Bill wasn't doing one of these Pac-12 games, I'd go, damn, it's not the same. I mean, I know he'll rant about, you know, mm -hmm. some obscure fact, but that's Bill. That's the right. beauty of Bill. Yeah. So uh, I had no idea he was sick. And, and maybe that's also why he didn't want to do it during the season. It said after the season because he was ill and he needed all the energy mm -hmm. he could uh, just to do the games. I just find amazing how you don't – I mean, obviously, like I said, maybe – talk to him once how you can feel close to somebody that you don't even know yeah that you can feel mm -hmm. that that yeah I, I yeah he's my guy right but you don't really even know the person so when i saw it it was just i literally went to two or three sites thinking at espn they're not going to put it up there if it's not true but right. i just i thought no no this can't be no no we didn't even hear he was sick no no everyone knows if he was sick and okay. i just and then mark had written and i just i it was just even though not knowing him, not being a friend, my heart just sunk. I yeah. remember just sitting down. I was with my oh, daughter. That's a part of our yeah. view. Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you ask young people today, you know, yeah. what do you know about Bill Walton? They say, well, oh, that's a guy that never stops talking on TV. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and Bill, when he <laughs> played at UCLA, he had a speech impediment. Yeah. And if he, when he did interviews, when he was a college player, he could barely talk. It was right. a very slow, yeah. drawn out process and very hard. And if you had said to someone back then, this would be the guy that would... Never stop no, talking. That's so true. Right? Yeah. You never yeah. think that. No, uh, exactly. We'll talk more about uh, the legendary Bill Walton coming up with one of his former teammates. 
Larry Farmer, who coached Bill as a, as a grad assistant on John Wooden and in Bill's 1974 team. So Larry will be kind enough to join us in a few minutes. So like I said, it's guys like Bill Walton that turned me into a sports fan and 50 years later why we're doing a podcast to celebrate the careers of people just like him. So, all right, let's move on. Mark, yeah, letter, I have, from, letter from the publisher. Well, before that, there's an ad I want to get to, and it's uh, for uh, Long Distance. And it's Bill Russell. He's got a basket behind him, uh, the basketball player, Bill Russell. Yeah. And um, a couple of chairs, and you see the ball going through the hoop. And he says, you can't miss when you put them through yourself. And it's basically saying to people, don't go to the operator. Save money by using long distance, you know, which today people would go, huh? What I have to get that? the operator. Yeah. Day. But they did a series of TV commercials. And the picture here for the ad is literally lifted from the TV commercial. Mm. And I think I've mm. told this story in the podcast before. When they initially did these this whole promo thing with, with Russell, the idea was... At the end, he was going to shoot the ball, miss, and go, I might miss, but you're not going to miss by using long distance. And he actually made the shot. And in the commercial, uh, he instead of saying a line, he just starts laughing because he couldn't believe the ball actually went through the hoop. <laughs> so that's my memory when I saw that ad, which is weird, though, because I went to YouTube to look at the ad they show here. And then when he hits a hook shot, that goes, and he goes, yeah, at the end. So there's actually another ad, and I think he's sitting on a chair where he put the ball in through the hoop without looking and it just, you know, it changed the whole advertising line. Yeah. I just like the fact I remember having to push dial zero. Yeah. As a kid. Operator. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, can you call this number? Can I get it's just amazing how no one would even know about that nowadays. Right. Or I remember, you know, we lived far away from from um family and, and so Sunday nights was my time for my mom to call mm -hmm, home and because mm -hmm. that was the cheapest long distance rates. God, and, remember though, that know, was right. We get the phone bill every yep, month and she'd yep. be like, who called? <laughs> your ass <laughs> this one is three dollars and yep. 35 cents. You're yep. paying for that one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. used to have the. I don't even know. I, well, I don't even know if, if you dialed four one one on your on your phone if it would do it. It still that does. Was, yeah, I did it really? not long ago. Yeah. And 411 was, and the time. Yeah, that, yeah the, the time is At eight. the tone. The, At the, time, tone, will the be. time will be. Did you ever, mind, just, just maybe my thing, they used to have a number that you could call and then it would dial your number back and call you? Yeah. I used to ask my mom all the time. God, she would be mad. <laughs> ring, ring, ring. She couldn't go, hello? Bell! Because it would just go to dial tone. <laughs> they got to have more fun things like that. And I'd be like... What? <laughs> you were a real troublemaker. Yes, <laughs> yes, no question, no, no question. All right, now Sorry. what do you got now, Mark? So the letters of the uh, publisher, and it's it's a the letter. It's about the Arthur, uh, the author Ray Kennedy, who wrote. Okay. Uh, um, I think it was the uh, Long Beach State story. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. And uh, basically, it's just he was apparently this big prankster. He passed away in 1988 at the age of 54, but he had nine children by the time he was 40. Imagine having nine oh. kids. And he was a prankster, like, you know, he, uh, uh, but also, like, he got in trouble because he said he was in the Marines, he'd been a prisoner of war, <laughs> and some of the stuff wasn't true. And so there was a little controversy around him. But So uh, that's good. He was the guy who was investigating yes. the corruption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but he was a character. I don't think he was lying, like, to try and further his his career or anything like that he just was an embellisher he just liked and, to, and, yeah, a, to, and a funny guy to do stuff and and um i thought it was like but to me the thing that really blew me away was the nine children because oh my god i mean could you imagine like you know no i i no, i don't Catholic, imagine man i oh, respect yeah. that but there's no i mean man I, yeah. i'm not philip rivers man <laughs> that guy's but shooting he, at a kid a year but he was a good investigative reporter. But like I say, he pissed some people off with his, his pranking. Oh, for sure. I like his for pranking. Sure. All right, scorecard. Do you guys see this story on the Cyclones of uh, Iowa State? They were looking to name their stadium from 50 years prior to that, 51 to be exact, 1923, a player by the name of Jack Trice who played in exactly one football game. Right. In his college career, he was a student athlete, he's married, Trice also happened to be black. And that kept him out of the first two games of the season before his teammates and coaches 
rallied around him, and he started the third game of the season at Minnesota. In the third quarter, he stopped the gap against virtually the entire Minnesota Gophers line, and he gets trampled, and he's taken off the field on a stretcher. And it was bad. He returned to Ames, Iowa on a train. He spends two days in the hospital before dying from Mm. internal bleeding. So the guy plays literally a half of a game or something Mm -hmm. like that, and and it kills him. The day Trice was buried, friends found in his jacket pocket a note that he had written to himself in a Minneapolis hotel room on the eve of the game, headed, my thoughts just before the real college game, first real college game of my life. It read, the honor of my race, family, and self is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things. I will. My whole body and soul are to be thrown recklessly about the field. Every time the ball is snapped, I will try be trying to do more than my part. And that is why the football stadium for the Iowa State Cyclones hmm. is called Jack Trice Stadium. Right. That's was, a good that's little awesome. nugget, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And remember, the story takes place in 1923. Right. So think of what's going in 23. The Ku Klux Klan has become powerful again in the South. I mean, it, it, black athletes were prevented from doing I mean, a lot of stuff. I mean, you're 24 years before yeah. Jackie Robinson right. is uh, is breaking the color barrier in baseball. There's, I think maybe Joe Lewis is around that time. But yeah, I mean, you know, being black in America uh, at that time was not in your favor. And the thing is, when you say these stories, and we've done a number of them, doesn't that sound like a movie? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't that sound like it? I'm surprised there know, hasn't been a movie the, the, made about the, that. You know, his whole life, and then he finally gets there, and I know it's tear jerking. It's a movie. Yeah. We keep talking about these things in here, and I keep thinking, man, you someone put that together, write that screenplay. That's an amazing thing. Because right. how many people you think that'll go just whatever uh, uh, Iowa State game this year? How many people you think no? They just look at that name uh, like we do none. when we go and it says yeah. Bob Rose. You know, well, that's auditorium. how I think it even happened. Fifth, this is now a hundred years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Fifty years later, they had like a little plaque. Yeah. And a professor told some students, basically, do you know what that plaque is? Go investigate it. Yeah. And when they investigated it, they were like, "Holy moly, this is quite a story." Yeah. So, yeah, you know, if you don't keep history alive, yes, a lot of things fall through yeah, the goes cracks. Away. Yeah. 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 Right, so, so 50 years after this guy dies, there's the push to name a stadium after yeah. him. And that stadium still bears his name to this day. Correct. So it's amazing how, you know, something that happened 100 years ago and nothing was done about it for yep. 50 years, then everything changes in, in, in the next 50 years. Is... Anything else in the scorecard section, guys? Uh, I just, you know, the with the WHA or the NHL was trying to hide their draft from the rival WHA. <laughs> so they're reading names in the newspaper. Then they'd hear them on the radio while they were still drafting. So they knew someone was telling the draft to the WHA. I thought it was amazing in those days how that was just, you know, you couldn't even have a draft because other teams were, other leagues were trying to take your guys. Just That's classic. And I loved both of those leagues, so... Didn't bother me. <laughs> I like that the you know the ACC was the first conference to do away with the team that wins the conference doesn't qualify for the NCAA tournament. Rather, the winner of the postseason tournament conference does. Seems silly then. Mm-hmm. I think seems silly now, to be mm-hmm. quite yeah. honest. I agree. Uh, but now another, uh, the Eastern College Athletic Conference will do the same thing with the Big Eight and the SEC heading in that direction as well. Now, 50 years later... They all do it. I mean, basically, the regular season is one long season to eliminate. I don't even know if teams get eliminated. I think they all qualify for the postseason tournament. But I think basically, that, you know, some seedings. of them, I think there's like one team. And I know Pac-12 used to have just the, one the team, team that the, was really bad. The, the 17th, last place yeah. get it. But, you know, it, um, it really kind of makes that big game between Arizona and UCLA in January not quite a big game. Well, that's, the, that's what, in a lot of ways, that's what happened to Georgia. They played in football this year. They played well through the whole season. They lost to Alabama in the in the conference championship, and That's right. they weren't in. Yep, that was it. I like the open door policy one. So we all know the Houston Texans now of the NFL, but did you know there was a Houston Texans in the New World Football League? Now this franchise I did not. not. Le- yes, well, this franchise did Yay. not last very long. But they were trying to do everything to make it fan friendly, so they wanted to make. Everything open, so for the fans. So Jim Garrett, who was the head coach, 
and was in the front office. He says he didn't want things to be secretive to the fans, so they're going to get to open practice sessions to the public. They'll have 10 minutes to, you know, mingle with the players. They'll get to tour the locker rooms. Everything was wide open. I don't know how much it really worked because that first season in 74, Houston went 3-7-1, and one, and then they didn't even finish the season as the Houston Texans. <laughs> they moved to Shreveport. And in the middle of the season, wow. so just imagine yeah. hotbed for football. Yeah, you're you're <laughs> you're, you're the Houston slash Shreveport team. They they yeah, they ended so up. So they were short lived, right? They were very short lived, half mm-hmm. a season. But one of the broadcasters, I think this was in Shreveport, one of the broadcasters for the team, or was in Houston. I have to look it up. Was Larry King? Oh, is that? Oh, right? wow! Yeah. Such a small world, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. They said it. Billy? Oh, yeah. Gene Mock. He was the uh, Expos manager on Houston's Cesar Cedeno. The nice thing about Cedeno is that he can play all three outfield positions all at the same time. <laughs> he was an amazing... I mean, I got him toward... I don't say tail end. He was an amazing player. He just... He could Cedeno, run with the wind. Yeah. yeah. He could he could field. He could hit. He was... He was... Um, I hate it when the Dodgers played him because he always... Would beat him. Yeah. But, so. um, I love Gene Mock. My favorite Gene Mock story was in manager of the Angels. Yeah. And I come up on, to him and, and I said, Hey, can we get a sound bite with you? And now a sound bite for people that are in the business is basically you want to get him to say something in the camera, mm-hmm. basically get sound from him about whatever topic you want. So but a lot of people don't know that. And Gene Mock didn't know that. And he goes, What? What? You want a bite of me? You want a bite of me? What? What is it? And he's yelling this in the locker room. And I'm like, ah. And my camera goes, man, don't use technical terms like that on people. I'm like, well, I thought it was fairly common, but yeah, I, guess I guess not. not. Can I no. just, can I tell a dumb story? Sure. Yeah. This just happened. This is when we were with the White Sox. You ever heard the, you all heard the saying softball questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. I go up to one of the White Sox players and I said, yeah, get a couple of minutes with you. He goes, he goes, what are you going to ask me? I said, there'll be easy questions. Basically, there's, I'm just going to, it'll be softball questions. Easy. He goes, softball? I don't know anything about softball. <laughs> so he didn't give me the interview. <laughs> I told him, I said, it wasn't well, about it's softball. It's not softball. Sorry. When he said that about your know, sound bites, how people just don't, you know, it's a sound bite. What the hell do you want from that? <laughs> you can just picture their face. Because I pictured the player on the White Sox face. He was all angry. He said, his locker, he goes, softball? I don't know anything about softball. And I'm like, sorry, dude. <laughs> you know, and you know, I'm, you know, I've got my hand going up like softball. I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to ask you about Jenny Finch, but you know, sorry. Uh, you got another, uh, they said it there, Mark? Uh, well, just the Bill Walton thing that's going to, you know, he just basically talked about his knee operation described by doctors a minor surgery. It's always minor when it's on someone else. Mm. And, you know, there it was, you know, Bill, that was the one thing that held him back, all those injuries. Right. Yeah. People forget that. I mean, obviously he had that great college career, but mm-hmm. he was the MVP of not only the NBA Finals yeah. in 77, yeah. but the next year of the NBA. He was a great NBA player. He was. And then he just right. had chronic f- problems with his feet mostly. Right, even even before he started. But um, So 50 years ago, we're at this time, they had the NBA draft. It was in late May. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a coin flip, I believe, between the Blazers and the Sixers. And the Blazers won it, and that's how he ended up in Portland. And I think we talked about this in an earlier podcast that had Philadelphia won mm-hmm. that cost, mm-hmm. there's a good shot he, uh, chance he would have gone to the ABA. They would have created a West Coast team for him, an L.A. team mm-hmm. for him to go to or whatever. But it ended up in Portland. He stayed on the West Coast, and it actually couldn't have been a better place for him because Portland was kind of – Free and easy, and mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, nature and you know, and love, yeah, Portland, yeah, yeah. yeah. love. I'll he never... was born too late, man. He should have been a hippie, he should have grown right. up in the he, he kind of was, yeah, yeah kind of was, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'll never forget my dad saying to me once, and he was not a fan of UCLA basketball having graduated from Cal. Yeah. He said, Bill Walton is the greatest college basketball player ever. And that mm-hmm. was it. That's, that's fair. There was no discussion yeah. of, well, what about... No, it was just a definitive statement from him. And I was just a kid. So I took it as as a fact. Mm-hmm. And to me, Bill Walton, for my dad to say that about a player, it was just kind of shocking because you just... You know, whenever you talk about players, mm-hmm. there's always a and, but what about? But with him, it was just... And so I had to go find out who this guy was. And so I would go and read my dad's old sport, Sports Illustrated and Bill was on the cover a lot of times. And sure enough, Walton, 50 years later, 
I I agree with my dad. I think mm-hmm. I think when it all comes down to it, he had the most dominating college basketball career ever. Yeah, yeah. I I just yeah he was. I just remember, like I said, I used to be a Kareem fan, and Bill Walton just always seemed to get the best of him in the NBA back in the 70s, at least the, the games I always listened to. And he had just an amazing outlet pass. So, like, once the ball was in Walton's hand, it was out of his hand. Yeah. He was just, Scott, I mean, I didn't get to see him in college, but, I mean, he was um, phenomenal. Yeah. Just absolutely phenomenal for people that never got to see him. And it's interesting when people think of Walton, you think of UCLA, you think yeah. of him with the Blazers winning a title, you think of him winning, with the Celtics and winning a title. But it was that people hair and for, appearance he oh, had right, that was right. great. But people forget he played many years for the Clippers too. You know, and like the, the Clippers are <laughs> yeah, just like they try, they Walton try was on the Clippers, to, yeah. really? You know, right. Well, those were the yeah. main foot injury yes. years too. Yeah. You know, he just was never on the court. But that so. six man when he was with the Celtics, Ooh, boy, was, boy, you talk what a about way to cap a career. But you think another team they got a great starting five, the Celtics do, and then here comes arguably one of the greatest players ever yeah, coming off the bench that's that, healthy, fit that team perfectly. Yeah, that was healthy Give us at the time. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Yes, man. Someone else who has plenty of Bill Walton stories is someone who played with him at UCLA, coached uh, him as well. Larry Farmer was the Bruins team captain in 1973, capped off his basketball career collegiately with a record of 89-1. and one. Still doesn't seem possible. And in 1974, he was on John Wooden's coaching staff when Bill won College Basketball Player of the Year. And the former player and coach joins us now. Larry, thanks for coming back on the Past Our Prime podcast. Oh, my pleasure, fellas. My pleasure. Larry, first off, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. When, when you heard that your friend and teammate had passed, what were your first thoughts? You know, uh, disbelief. Um, you know, I had no idea you know, that Bill uh, was ill or had been battling uh, cancer. Uh, that was something that, you know, he, you know, chose not to share with um, with us or me. And um, so I was shocked, uh, you know, saddened, obviously. But, you know, I, I remember, you know, my brother and teammate as this invincible warrior. And, you know, to hear that, you know, he had succumbed to uh, the cancer was 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 quite a shock. Larry, when we had you on the show in January, you spoke of what a great teammate he was. And, you know, he was the guy, you know, he could have had a major ego, right? And rightfully so. But he was just another one of the guys, wasn't he? Absolutely. I mean, if if there's ever been a person who, you know, could have stood out more and certainly pounded his chest and demanded, you know, all of the attention in the room, it could have been Bill. Uh, but he was exactly the opposite of that. You know, he was always giving credit to his teammates. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure the guys that he played with in the NBA would say the same thing. But he was always giving credit to his teammates. Um, you know, no one was ever more important, you know, more center stage than the guys that surrounded him. Uh, he made us all feel, you know, special as individuals. And whenever I was with Bill, you know, <laughs> He, he always made me feel like I was the superstar, but I was the superstar uh, to Bill in his life. Uh, and, and that was something that was just so very warm and charming and engaging about him uh, as a friend. He was a really hyped prospect. What are your memories of the very first time you met him? You know, uh, when you when I first met him, um, We were in a team meeting, you know, the the school had just started and um, we were all in this team meeting. You know, he was seven foot tall. He had flaming red hair. Um, You know, he could not have been nicer. He was a year younger than me. And so, you know, there's this proving out process that all players go through when you're playing on a team, especially at the level of UCLA. And everybody that came in, you know, to UCLA at that time had credentials. You were the best or all sit or all American. You came in with some kind of notoriety. So we'd heard all this stuff about Bill. And he certainly had a lot of pressure on him because I don't think he'd been on campus for two seconds before people started making those uh, comparisons. Well, is he going to be as dominant as Lou Alcindor? Uh, And so, you know, he always had that weight. But I just remember how soft-spoken he was. You know, he spoke with a little bit of a stutter, um, but certainly not a gregarious, uh, manding guy that came in and, and wanted to draw all the attention. And then I remember the first time I watched him play. You know, it was 
okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody's making this up. This guy is really good. There are some things he's doing out there that, you know, I hadn't seen before. And so it, it just <laughs> there. But I just remember him being very soft-spoken, almost a little shy when I first met him. We've all heard so much about what kind of player, and we know what kind of player Bill Walt was on the court. Yes. Do you have a special memory, you and him, off the court? Yes. You know, I, 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 I tell one story. I, I write about it in, in my book, and, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, to share it in, in, in this vein. But, you know, as you mentioned, my senior year, I was the team captain, and um, – my birthday, it's January 31st, and my birthday that year fell in between us playing Notre Dame and us playing USC. So my birthday fell right in the middle. And I don't remember, and maybe it was in the Daily Bruin on campus, but somehow Bill found out that it was my birthday. So we're all in the locker room right before practice starts, and Bill announces to the team that after practice, everybody is to hustle up and get through training table because he's having a little birthday party for me, you know, over at the frat house. Bill wasn't a frat member, but he had a room at a frat house. And he said, we're having a little birthday party for for, uh, for, for Larry. So everybody's got to be over there. So I, I, I remember looking at Bill saying, you know, uh, Bill, uh, my girlfriend's going to take me out to dinner. He says, well, she can wait. <laughs> but right after training table, everybody's going to my house, the whole team. So there was nobody that could say no to the big redhead when he was being that certain about what everybody was going to do. And so sure enough, everybody kind of hustled up. We got our showers. We all sprinted over to the training table. And, you know, he's kind of looking around the room, making sure that everybody kind of speeds this up because we're on the clock. And uh, we get over to uh, get over to the frat house and Bill's prepared for this. You know, had a keg. Had some wine. You know it was during the season. Coach wouldn't forgive us. But uh, <laughs> we, spent, we spent about an hour there. We walked into the room, and a lot of us arrived at the same time. Bill's got the Rolling Stones on his stereo just blasting the paint off the wall. <laughs> and we had this party, and it was all his idea, and it was his idea to celebrate my birthday. The whole team was there. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that. It wasn't a moment that it was just me and Bill, but it was kind of just me and Bill because he went through all of that trouble to make sure that, you know, my birthday got uh, got recognized by the team. Was he a deadhead back then? Was he a big deadhead fan or Grateful Dead fan, or did that come later? You know, I, I'm not sure when they came into the equation, but I can tell you that day um, and, and other times when I was around Bill, uh, he had those Rolling Stones, and I'm telling you what, you uh, you might as well have been in the same room with them because he would play that stuff <laughs> so loud. And it's like, Bill, are your neighbors going to be okay with this? He's oh, yeah, I, I told him ahead of time I'd be playing my music. You know, sometimes guys like Bill come off as if they're trying to be weird or they're trying to be zany, and I mean this as a total compliment. He wasn't trying to be anything other than who he was. And I think that sense of authenticity is what drew people to him. Do you think that's true? Oh, no question. No question. You know, he was a very bright guy, very intelligent, but he was fun loving. He enjoyed his life. He enjoyed uh, making fun of himself. He wasn't that kind of superstar that was afraid to criticize himself or you know, to, to, to laugh at what other people might have thought was funny or zany. And it was that that part of him and his personality that was genuine, I think, that attracted people to him. You know, when you see him with his arms raised and, you know, he, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, he felt that way. And he made other people feel that way. And, you know, you, you can't front that kind of feeling. You know, it, it's just too genuine. And I think if the many people that I've heard uh, tell stories about Bill, you know, now, you know, now that he's gone, if, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times, how they met him, how he was genuinely interested in hearing about them, maybe a funny story that he told or the way he was dressed or the way he acted, you know, this is who he was. And I think that's why so many people love him. There, I know him and, and Coach Wood, and I won't say butted heads, but I mean, Coach Wood was conservative, 
Bill was a little out there and stuff, but there's an image I see in later years where Coach Wooden is giving him the biggest hug on the court. <laughs> was there, there was this love and respect that they had for one another, even though they did butt heads a little bit in the playing days. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, because of, of Bill's huge or bigger than life personality and a couple of the little run ins that he had with Coach that, you know, have become public and, and legendary their own right you know as young people uh, just about everybody on on every team that i played for at ucla pushed the envelope and tried to see if you know how much we could test coach wood and that wasn't a test that any of us was, was going to win i mean we had rules there, there were there were rules that were associated with the team and we all had to follow and even you know some of the ones that you heard uh, about Bill not wanting to cut his hair or shave his hair, or, you know, when he got arrested for for protesting, you know, these weren't. Um, this wasn't in any way him being disrespectful to Coach Wooden. You know, he was merely following some of the things that that he believed in, and like a lot of young people, you know, that that are growing up, we need direction, and we need direction from a role model, from a disciplinarian, and that's certainly what Coach Wooden provided for all of us. But there was never any doubt, uh, even when they were butting heads, how much Coach Wooden genuinely um, loved Bill, how much he respected him, how much he appreciated I remember a few years ago, Bill Walton came out to Anaheim to do a game with the White Sox. He was ha- being the color, pl- color guy for the, for the TV. I noticed when he walked in, every little kid, not adults, little kids were just following him. What is it? <laughs> that Bill put off, that made little kids that had no idea who he was right. follow him? Well, you know, I, I, you know his, his size, for one, could be a little bit intimidating for anybody, um, you know, because he was a giant of a man. But again, it's that that quality that he had, that soft-spokenness, that, that feeling of, of genuine, um, I think that immediately... Uh, gave you a calm uh, when you're around him. You know, he, he didn't use his size to intimidate, but he used his size to embrace. There was a warmth about him. And I can certainly see, you know, little kids at first being curious, but then when he would smile or the first thing out of his mouth, you know, could be something that was exactly at their level. <laughs> you know, he could have been, you know, he could be childlike when he wanted to be. And so that to me is not a surprise that. Uh, little people, young people, uh, young children would have been um, mesmerized by Bill, uh, again, because of his size, but then, you know, his, his warmth, his ability to, um, you know, to relate and, and make you feel comfortable. We're talking with Larry Farmer. Larry mentioned he has a book out, Roll of a Lifetime, Larry Farmer and the UCLA Bruins. Larry, a teammate, team captain of the 1973 UCLA Bruins and teammate of of Bill Walton. You mentioned, Larry, people forget that Bill had a major speech impediment and it, it took him years to fix it. And I think that once again, that just shows another side of him of the drive that he had to get better Yes. in whatever he chose to get better at. Because, I mean, he became... <laughs> You know, a college basketball announcer, an Emmy award-winning college basketball announcer. You probably couldn't have said that what happened 50 years ago, but he made it happen with the help of others. Yes, I mean that. That again, like you mentioned, that, that just shows his drive and determination. You know, I think that was one of the things that uh, uh, initially um, you kind of knew when when Bill liked you and trusted you. Um, because he was a different person in the locker room at UCLA. Um, and some of it had to do with his speech impediment. The, the more comfortable he got with exposing that to his teammates, then the more engaging he would be in conversations. And it took him a while, um, if at all, to trust people because I, I, you know, I don't know how often people made fun of him or, or you know, what baggage he might have brought you know, in that regard to UCLA. But I know there was a great deal of trust that was earned, um, you know, in the locker room. And that's why he was so willing to open up and, and, and share. Um, one of the last times I saw Bill, and I used to love to tease him about this, I'd walk up to him and we'd hug each other. And I'd say to Bill, you know, I was in probably five or six street fights this last year because I have people come up to me and tell me, 
how much they hated your broadcasting, and then that would result in us squaring <laughs> off. And, and you know, Bill, I won most of the fights. But, you know, eventually we got to calm this down. He just laughed. Ah, ah, ah. He knew I was thinking. He's my body. As broadcasters, you ever share like a broadcast together or be at the same event? I don't recall, and I know that must have happened initially in his career when he would do UCLA games, and I was an assistant coach that I would be around him. But I, no, I never got to sit in on a broadcast or, or sit next to him. You know, I, I remember uh, at the end of last year, I did a podcast with Bill. It was about uh, about 30 minutes long, and he and I were supposed to go back and forth. There was a moderator, but he and I, the way Bill described it, hey, you and I just talk, we'll talk hoops. And so if our conversation yeah. was 25 minutes long, Bill talked for 20 of those 25. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you got five minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> If, and if I'm not mistaken, your very last game at UCLA was the 1973 championship game against Memphis, which was Bill Walton or maybe the greatest single performance by a college basketball player. Would you agree? Yes. And I'll tell you a very interesting fact that I found out when Bill and I were talking about him doing a writing the forward for my book, we started to tell different stories because I, I have, you know, hundreds of stories in the book. And there were a couple of stories that directly involved Bill. And one of them was his 21 for 22 performance against Memphis State. And I was telling Bill, you know, I knew he was having a special night because usually, you know, I was a garbage man. I, I scored points in the fast break and on offensive rebounds. That was kind of my, um, you know, the way I, I scored points. Um, we used to uh, call that, you know, being a, a garbage man. I was a real good garbage man. And so it, uh, it, it dawned on me about midway through the second half that my shot opportunities hadn't been very many. And, you know, that meant we were in a, more of a half-court game. But it also meant, you know, Bill wasn't missing very many shots. So anyway, um, when Bill and I were talking about this all these many years later, and, you know, he's, he's writing the forward for, for my book, and we're telling all these different stories, you know, and I, you know, that was the greatest games that I've ever witnessed. You know, you're 21 out of 22. And Bill says, well, that's not exactly accurate, Larry. He says, um, you know, I was really 23 out of 24. So I said, what are you, what are you talking about, Bill? He said, well, yeah, during the game, they, the, the officials wrongly called me for two basket interferences where he jumped. We couldn't dunk in those days. And so his hand went in the cylinder and he just let the ball go. And so they took away two baskets that he made because they said he interfered, you know, with the ball going in. So as he liked to point out to me, he was really 21 for, or excuse me, 23 for 24, but he only gets credit for the 21 out of 22. <laughs> He was robbed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would have changed his whole career. <laughs> hey, Larry, those bonds formed 50-plus years ago at UCLA. They really stood the test of time, didn't they? No, no question. And, and that was never more true than the 1972 and 1973 50-year anniversary of those championships that we celebrated at UCLA. I mean, every living member of those teams came back. And that was a huge tribute, not only to Coach Wooden and the foundation that he laid uh, for us, but the relationships that we built over that period of time, the brief period of time that we played together, but then the 50-year um, friendships, you know, that remain. It, it, it really made us more like brothers. And, and that was the unique thing about the big redhead. Um, you know, he was always in the center of all of that. And, um, you know, he's going to be greatly, greatly missed. So, as you remember from the last time you were on, we do have a little trivia segment, 50-50. No Mannix questions today, okay? This is a Bill <laughs> Walton question for you. <laughs> all right. And it's actually from 40 years ago, not 50 years ago, okay? True okay. or false? Bill actually made a couple appearances on TV and movies, okay? True okay. or false, the first time... Bill appeared in a film was in the classic comedy Ghostbusters in 1984. True or false? False. It is true. If you watch the closing credits of Ghostbusters, 
There's a scene where all the Ghostbuster people are shaking hands with the people in New York and in Central Park. Bill is like an extra on the way back. I don't know if they, no. the Clippers were playing were playing in New York at that time or whatever, and he was walking by, and they were shooting it. But you can see him. There's a shot where you see a reporter running up to some fans, and you see Bill in the background right there. No. You know, leave it to well, Mark to take up. this really nice interview yes. about uh, yeah. and uh, and take it off to the Stay Puffs Marshmallow. <laughs> Hello, exactly. man. Exactly. Ghostbusters. Who, you, who, you gonna call? who are you going to call? That's right. Yeah, I'm not calling There's, you. No. <laughs> hey, Larry, <laughs> again, want to thank you so much Good for job. sharing your thoughts and some stories in regard to your friend and teammate, Bill Walton. Stay healthy. We don't want you going anywhere for a long, long time. Enjoy That's your day. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, right. Larry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, there you have it. You know, just it was great. one of the best guys yeah. you're, you're ever going to yeah, talk about. I agree. It. And I think I wonder if it's if it's part of the reason that UCLA was so dominant was John had Wooden had such a, a a great ability to pick guys that were talented and had character. Mm -hmm. That's it. You That's know. It. You know, they, these character. guys. These guys all had each other's backs. It was. It truly was about the betterment of the team. Right. And everyone understood their role. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't guys going. I, I've got a score. I scored my whole life. They accepted their role, made the became dominant in that role, and they won. Yeah, and what a nice tribute to Bill Walton too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For it's sure. Just a, such a huge loss. And the thing is, is I hope generations of kids that are coming up now will look back and look at Bill Walton obviously as the person but to realize what an amazing player he was in college and in the pros okay next up let's talk about something that doesn't get talked about all that often but this school is like you said Mark when you think of Johns Hopkins what do you think of I think of the medical school and I think of lacrosse that's right the Jays take it back Johns Hopkins dominated lacrosse when the national championship was decided by coaches voting and not a tournament. But since the eight-team tourney started, Johns Hopkins has been shut out. In 71, Cornell won. In 72, Virginia. In 73, Maryland. Hopkins has been waiting for this moment, finally last Saturday, before 11,000 fans. And, Mark, one streaker at Rutgers that was me. University. That was me. The whole lacrosse picture fell back into what Hopkins considers proper perspective they had a coach mm -hmm. which seems to have been the the if there's one common thesis of the 70s college scene is that you had these coaches that just won title after title after title and his name was bob scott six national titles in 20 years he was retiring from the job at the end of the year so this one meant a lot to him so a long article, think about that. A long uh -huh. article, the first article in this issue is on college lacrosse. You, you know, before there was the Toronto Blue Jays, you know, because they didn't come into existence in the late 70s, yeah. there was the Blue Jays, you know, of John Hopkins. That was the Blue Jays team. And uh, they dominated that. Well, I, I mean, I got to say, since you guys said about Johns Hopkins, you know what I think about when I think of it? What? Huh. Step Brothers. <laughs> because because he goes when he's when when uh, the Will Ferrell character is going up, she goes she goes you know he's a medical doctor who she's marrying and he goes he went to an established Johns Hopkins and Will Ferrell's like, you know Johnny Hopkins I know him we just smoke weed together no. <laughs> it's stupid but when you said Johns Hopkins all I thought is yeah. Johnny Hopkins they just smoke weed with him in the back of the school well, you know sorry and and and. and <laughs> Remind me again, you didn't get into Stanford, Bill? <laughs> I don't understand that. I hey, just, uh, on stupid random movie things, I'd be like, I'd be right in the middle of school. Now, now, has anyone seen a picture of John Hopkins? There is a photograph of John from like around 1871. So he was born in 1795 and he died in 1873. And it's not the most flattering uh, picture you've ever yeah, seen. Of, I'm thinking he was that picture. He kind of, yeah, kind of looks he like, was, I, I don't want to sound mean, see. but the picture, he almost looks like a cadaver there. Well, he uh, might have been. <laughs> smoking weed. <laughs> <back>. <laughs> yeah. he, was a, he was a philanthropist his whole life. So, yeah. But in those days, in remember in those days, they never smiled. No. Every yeah. picture you see, they always look angry like babe ruth 
And how many pictures saw Babe Ruth smiling? None. He right. looked like a miserable guy. And then we hear about it and how great a guy. So Johns Hopkins might have been the greatest guy around. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Philly again. Yes, the Phillies were a bad team for a long, long, long time. They've been pretty good for most of my life, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. The last 50 years, a few down years, but they're usually pretty competitive. But there's still a few years from being really good. But right. they have been so bad that just not being horrible was different. Uh, how bad in in 1972 they were 59 and 97. Mm-hmm. This despite the fact that Steve Carlton won the Cy Young Award that year with a record of 27 and 10. So if you take Carlton out of it, they're 32 and 87. I mean that is uh, historically. There's a couple teams on pace for that this year, but we won't mention who. What will Carlton have to throw like that to win a game? I <laughs> yeah, mean, he didn't get a lot right. of run support. No. Uh, one reason, Dave Cash, acquired by the Pirates for Ken Brett. He became an all-star in Philadelphia in 74 and 75. Over 200 hits both years, hit 300 each year. He's had a steady influence on the high-strung Philly shortstop Larry Boa. Dave tells me I'm the best He's ever seen, and I don't know if he's blowing smoke or not, but I'm starting to believe in myself, said Boa. The Phils would finish at 80 and 82, mm-hmm. 1.8 million fans for the season, the most ever at the time for Philadelphia. So baseball was on the rise in the city of brotherly love. Right, and they were under the shadow of the Flyers. He just won the Stanley Cup. But you know what's significant about that 1974 season where they finished 80 and 82? Any idea? No. Mm-hmm. It was the last time they would finish under 500 for a decade. Yeah. Wow. Not till 1985 wow. again. So, And I think Mike Schmidt on that team had 36 homers and 116 yeah. RBIs. Yeah. And Carlton and, and, and Lomberg, Lomborg combined for 33 wins on that team in 74. So they had a couple good pitchers, too. Yeah. And Dave Cash was a guy, just a glue guy. Yeah. Dave Cash didn't stand out. He wasn't a guy that I thought, oh, God, to get him. But he's one of those guys that on a team of the Boas and Schmitz and guys like that just knew how to bring guys together. And yep. then he performed on the field as well. But, yeah. A man who hardly left a mark. Now, this was a crazy <clears throat> story, wasn't it? Fred yeah. Mundy was a druggist, which, you know, sounds horrible, but I think it meant he was like a pharmacist. Pharmacist, or yeah. They used to call him a druggist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's nuts. He was a motorcycle racer and... He's on a track. Where was it? It was in was it in New Mexico? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Baja. Baja. Okay. It was the Baja, right. Baja 100. That's right. The Baja 100. And he's on a track, if you want to call it. And, you know, there's races all the time. So they put like little signs, mm-hmm. turn left here. But when mm-hmm. the race is over, they don't go and, and take it down. And then there's another race and then another race. And, you know, the fact that people would get lost seems like a, a, would be a normal part yeah. of the race. And sure enough, he gets off track and he gets really off track. And in fact, he goes missing and they send out all sorts of search parties for him. They cover a 60, 70 mile radius. He walks for days and days, they later find out, but it does not have a happy ending. Fred Mundy died uh, out in the desert there because basically he turned left when he should have turned right. Yeah, people had said, they said, he was a really proud man. Too proud, they think, he was just so disgusted with himself for getting lost and running out of gas that he simply could not accept the idea of a rescue. He was going to walk out by himself and not wait around to be found. Because isn't there one part of the article where it says he had, that he had come across a cabin that had food and water in there and could have lasted a few days, and he never went up to it. He yeah. just kept walking. I thought maybe by then he might have been a little... Delusional, yeah. maybe. something like that, because yeah, that maybe. doesn't make any yeah, sense. Fair. But yeah, that's what his brother said, that that he was like, nope, I'll either get out myself, basically, or, yep. or I'm not getting out. And that that's what happens. So. Is there any, if that, I mean, mind you, if that happened to you guys, would you, would he, he his motorcycle ran out of gas. In that situation, do you stay next to your motorcycle and just sit there? Do you walk a little bit? What is the thing? I'm not saying we'd be able to well, make that decision. What do you do? I would do probably, I would walk just about 15 minutes from the bike just to get a lay of the land, see what's mm-hmm. around, mm-hmm. and then go back because you figure other people are going to start looking for you and trying to figure out where you went off. So if you stay near the bike, you have a better chance, I think, of being found. Well, let me go by it. Or heard, high ground. I have heard this. I don't know. I, I read this. People that get lost at sea, and mm-hmm. you hear some of them tried to swim away, that the brain 
has a way of telling you you can do it. There's something in the, mm-hmm. there's there's things in the brain, enzymes in the brain. That See, my 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 draw. my brain tells me I can't. Yes, but I'm saying they <laughs> I, say they say when you're out of the, they say when you're out in the water sometimes your brain will tell you, oh I can make it there right. even though you can't. So right. maybe he had that. Oh, that's 50 miles. Right, I right. can get then, my sleep. You yeah. know, Bill yeah. and I do this joke where we say I'll give you 75 cents if you do some stupid thing. Or yeah, a dollar twenty five. I'll go more. <laughs> so Bill, I'll give you a dollar and thirty five cents. We'll take you to Bob. Uh-huh. We'll leave you in the middle of nowhere and see how long it takes you to get back to civilization. What do you say? <laughs> it's, it's, it's too much. Yeah. I mean, I'm honestly a dollar thirty-five. A dollar <laughs> would be better. Come on. Uh, my no, daughter well, doesn't get those jokes. No. But anyway, cost him his life, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 So. so I guess I shouldn't be laughing you at this. Son of a bitch. <laughs> no, I don't mean it. But I'm just saying it. It is a. I mean, he was a proud guy, and I mean, he had intelligence. He obviously had skill because they said he just decided to take up motorcycle riding because he found it to be exhilarating right so just you know sad it, i had it in that way it didn't have to though i don't think traps in an open field the history of the u.s open is filled with guys who lost the open you know it wasn't necessarily and and that was the case coming up later this month when hell or when wins wins the open they give example after example of major golf stars who had big leads in the final round Mm -hmm. only to see it all go away. Here's an example. Uh, Sam Snead uh, needed a par on 18 to win it. Instead, he shot an eight (laughs) (laughs) and lost in a playoff. Uh, 1966, Arnold Palmer is up seven strokes heading to the back nine. If he shoots one over from that point, he sets the 72 hole open record with four holes left to play he's up five strokes just needs par for the record on 15 he bogeys billy casper birdies the lead was three to 16 palmer with another bogey casper with a birdie two holes to play it was down to a stroke the record now out of the question on 17 billy saved par but arnie couldn't missing a seven footer bogeyed his third straight hole heading to 18 it was tied we were both in some kind of daze because of what was happening says casper it seemed to happen so fast it was like neither one of us had any control over anything they would play an 18 hole playoff the next day with casper prevailing by four strokes so you know it just you in golf you seem like you'd be like it's just a new hole start over mm-hmm. but it starts to wear on their mind and their psyche and before you know it these huge leads are gone well I, I can understand why huge leads disappeared in the early days of the u.s open like they have pictures here like from the 20s and 30s and these guys are golfing and they got ties on right and they've got you know <laughs> knickers or these weird clothing yeah. you know and i'm like of course in that heat you know, yeah. playing golf with a tie on? Nah. Yeah. I'd have a hard time maintaining a lead. Johnny Miller's on the cover of this issue, June 10th, 1974. He was having a fantastic season. He won like the first, I want to say the first three tournaments yeah. of the season. He had taken that win and momentum into 74. He had won five tournaments leading into the Open. He was 27 years old. His wife and kids keeping him grounded. We go on to have a Hall of Fame career and then work as a golf analyst for NB Sports for years and years. But he did not play well in the upcoming U.S. Open and once again showed that momentum, momentum, you know, didn't matter. So Johnny did end up winning. They said he won 25 PGA Tour events, including two majors. Yes. Well, he won the U.S. Open in 73. 73. Yeah, right. Didn't shoot like a 68. It was like something where he was... 63. He, yeah, he shot, he's 63. Yeah. It was so good that the next year, the course was so tough yeah. that the, after the first round, I think guys were... Uh, the, the best score was three over par. Yep. Right. So... You know, but yeah, Johnny Miller, you know. It would be Hal Irwin's year. He would win yeah. it, and then he'd win two more, including in 1990 when he was 45 years old. Oof. Yeah. Crazy. The delirium of cup fever. Uh, there was a time when America's Cup was a big deal here in this country. Now, that was the beginning years for me at of ESPN where they didn't have much programming, so mm-hmm. they'd have these yacht races mm-hmm. on and... Dennis Connor. Dennis Connor was, uh, <laughs> that was, was our a, guy. And, and, and Ted Turner was big. <laughs> That's right. right. Ted Turner. Yeah, we talked about that in an earlier yeah. issue. Dennis Connor won the cup four times 74, 80, 87, and 88, and he lost it twice 83 and 95. They say golf is a sport for the Richie Riches, but I think yacht racing might yes. take it to a new level. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would think Are they, so. I mean, I mean, first you need when, water. When yeah. Dennis Connor 
sort of left the sport, I guess. Does anyone ever talk about that anymore? I mean, I don't. No. I mean, it used to be you no. used to hear about it. Right. Now it's nothing. No, I had to look to see if it still happens. Yes, is it? It does. Yes. Oh, okay. New Zealand are the Australians and New Zealand, New Zealand. Are dominating it now, but yeah. no Americans yeah. anymore. Yeah, uh, they are still in it. Oh, okay, but okay. Not, we haven't won. Okay. Now the next one is a headline that looks like it's a typo. Um, it says F L Ying on the bases, but that was the actual headline. I never yeah. quite understood what yeah. it meant. It's about. Herb Washington. Herb Washington was on the 1974 A's, brought in by Charlie Finley to be a pinch runner, a designated pinch runner. He never once played in the field. He never had an at-bat. He just would pinch run. He was a track star, and he was fast. He hadn't played baseball in seven years since his junior year in high school, and so Herb signed on the dotted line, joined this the two-time champion A's as a pinch runner. He never took the field, as you mentioned, just went in the game trying to steal bases. In Chicago, he gets his first steal of the season in May. Dick Allen, the White Sox first baseman, asked if he was going, to which Washington said as he broke for second base, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like so, Roadrunner right. Hawaii Coyote. So he had a little bit of um, chutzpah. He wasn't that great. He was learning from Campy Campaneris and Bill North about the art of stealing bases. Got off to a slow start. I think he was... You know, had four steals and was picked off twice and caught five times to begin. And people were like, "Uh uh-oh. But as the season progressed, he improved, finishing the season with 29 steals in in 45 attempts. Not a a great ratio by any means. And uh, his most famous moment was getting picked off in the World Series by Mike Marshall and the Dodgers. After 13 games in 1975, his baseball career is over. Becomes a very successful businessman, owned at one time like 30 McDonald's franchises. So he went from being fast on the base pass mm-hmm. to fast food. But he can make a quick buck. He, but the, he did. But the thing is, is did you read about the fact that he was a sportscaster? And that after he put down the microphone, like after a noon sportscast, he got a message to call Charlie Finley. And he thought it was a joke. And he called, and that's when they wanted him to actually be on the team. That's too funny. And you think that, I, I, I don't know. So, what, does Scott, you would remember, or Mark might. Did he play the whole year with the A's, or at least in the majority? The majority, yeah. How many players, I wonder, in baseball history have done that and never have had an at-bat? None. None. No, He's the it. only yeah. guy. I mean, you know, and you just, yeah. you read about him, what you told me about him being a businessman. This was a smart smart man yeah you know the fact that he had said he said i'm i had a tough start because stealing bases is much different than running straight right he said so you had to learn the angles and maury wills at a time yep. helped him do that so for what he was able to do for never having done it is app is another amazing feat yep 427 a case in point long beach state basketball and football are being investigated by the ncaa you see up until a few years ago it was illegal to pay players to come to your school now Mm -hmm. it's a free-for-all but that's a different story altogether tark the shark jerry tarkanian came from right here in pasadena pcc he was Mm -hmm. the coach at pasadena city college Mm -hmm. prior to that riverside city college yeah Six years, he goes 201 and 11 at those two schools. So he takes a job at Long Beach State, and with it, an almost five thousand dollar pay cut. Mm-hmm. He's been at the he's been the hoops coach at Long Beach State, but he left in April of '73 to take the head coaching job at UNLV on January 1st, 1974, making good on a promise I made to my wife two years ago. Football coach Jim Stainsland resigned after his fifth season at Long Beach State and went into private business. Five days later, NCAA says that they have violations against Long Beach State and the school is in a lot of trouble. According to Texas's Daryl Royal, you're out there trying to sell yourself and your school mm-hmm. and the prospect ain't hearing a word you're saying. All he's wondering is when you're going to start talking money. Indiana's Bobby Knight. When they get to the bottom of Watergate, they'll find a football coach. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you, you look at this. We're talking in this article, Long Beach State. Do we yeah. ever talk about Long Beach State anymore? They don't play football. No. And the basketball team is, you know, doesn't do as much as it used to. It's almost like not just Tarkanian leaving, but this investigation, I don't want to say killed the program, but they were in the tournament every year and gave teams, yeah. you know, gave teams a battle. Yes. And now yeah. you're just, I mean, I, I 
just when I look at that, I think, they keep thinking, this is Long Beach State that we don't even talk about right. anymore. But in the time, they were one of the teams they really wanted to come down hard on. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it's the football and basketball programs yeah. that were under investigation. Yeah. And so the football coach leaves. And then Tarkanian in 73 yep. went to UNLV. Right. So, and again, it comes down to the argument, do you punish the players? Do you punish the coach? You know, you punish the school when the coach gets scot free. Right, right. Long Beach State was good in basketball. Mm-hmm. In 1971, they lost to UCLA by two points in the tournament. Mm-hmm. They came within a whisker of beating Wooden's teams in its heyday. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Tark was a great coach, but he lost three years in a row to Wooden in the NCAA tournament. But they had great basketball programs. And Terry Metcalf, who had a long yeah. NFL career, played yeah. Long Beach State. Yep. Yeah. But what really killed the Long Beach State football program was uh, they hired George Allen to kind of save the program mm-hmm. in, uh, mm-hmm. was it 90 or whatever? Yeah, yep. And he coached one season there. And then on December 31st, 1990, he died at his home, yeah. was found dead at his home. And then they, they ran the football program one more year with Willie Brown, the yep. former Raider. They went, I think, 2-9 and nine that year. And then the and football was program. Yeah, I, re- was I was at Fullerton when they eliminated yeah. all yeah, of it. It was just eliminated. stunning. But if you look at Long Beach State, who took over for a Tarkanian? Lou Olson. Lou Olson, yeah. And then they also, didn't they have George Gervin that was possibly going to be there? Then he got well, homesick and went him. back. Right. Yeah, you then he got, I'm Canadian, saying, yeah. They, yeah. Had, like, oh. they had the makings of a championship team. Yeah. And mind you, they obviously weren't doing it above board uh, can, back in the day. But boy, boy, I just, it, just amazing Roscoe little program. and Clifton yeah. Pondex were both playing at Long Beach, but the recruiting tells of the brothers were something else. Their high school coach said Clifton had over 300 offers, of which a third of them were illegal. <laughs> Washington State offered Clifton an Eldorado and sent him 100 bucks to pay for phone calls to his girlfriend. Fresno State offered me an assistant coach's job if I delivered him. When the West Coast Relays came to Fresno, at least 10 schools offered Clifton free hotel rooms where he could throw a party and charge anything to room service. A pack eight school put ten thousand dollars on the dining room table next to his letter of intent it was just completely out of control tarkanian said it makes me sick that anyone can punish athletes and rip a coach to pieces without giving them a chance to defend themselves next week the 74 charges against long beach state are revealed it didn't end well but like you said tark left for greener pastures and Kind of the same stuff mm-hmm. followed him to UNLV, right. both success and uh, charges NCAA, of corruption. Right. Yeah. Today, with name, image, and likeness, now schools are going to start paying oh, their God, players. Yeah. None of this would have made it. Tarkanian would be winning titles every yeah. year because he loved. Yeah, the, was the kids love playing for him. The one thing that I loved about Long Beach State too is the baseball team. They were the Niners. Or whatever, but the baseball team were the dirtbags. Yeah, I love that. They have, they have yeah. their own name. Yeah, you know? Eric Burns right. and that. Yeah. For the record, it was a big week for Chris Evert. Yeah. Yeah. She beat Martina Navratilova 6-3, 6-3 to win the finals of the Italian Open. And she won the Mother Goose Stakes, <laughs> second of leg of the Triple Crown for Phillies, covering the one and a quarter mile in 148 and two-thirds. She was very she fast. She won the Mother right? Goose? No, she was fast. She could run, yeah, She could, man. Of course, that was a horse that was named after oh, the tennis thanks. star Thank and went you. on to win the U.S. Philly Triple Crown uh, and earning the Eclipse Award for Outstanding Three-Year-Old Philly in 1974. I just love that story. I was looking at it, too. I kept thinking, that's <laughs> okay. what I, that was what I thought. That's great, because she uh, wins okay. horse racing and beats Martina Navratilova. Yeah. I would say that'd be a fairy tale finish. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You guys got anything? Yeah, the uh, WHA named their MVP, Gordy Howe. Of course. Oh, 46. Wow. Really? 46. Nope. And the rookie of the year, his son, Mark. Yeah. Well, right. Gordy had 100 points that year, so I think they, you know. Let's wrap it right. up with the 19th hole. I've got a good one here. Move to protest, and then we'll, we'll end it where we started it. It's bad enough when basketball players like Bill Walton are offered gigantic salaries to play the game they, and he puts in quotes, love. But when you pay them millions of dollars and offer to move a whole team to accommodate one man, that's going too far. Ron Herdman, Branchville, New Jersey. You know, he may have a point, you know, if you're moving or uh, complete organizations to different cities. Weren't they going to move the Kentucky team or something? Yeah. 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 So there you have it. Anyway, I want to thank Larry Farmer for coming on and talk, talking to us about about Bill and Miss the Big Red. We're going to miss you, Bill, it was um, thank you. It yeah. was great to yeah. watch your 
your casts and, and see you as a Bruin and a Blazer and, and that Celtics team. Oh, I hated those Celtics teams. Me too. God, I hated yeah, they, them. They were just so good. <laughs> and he made them just that much better, right? man. Uh, all right. For Bill, for Mark, Jeremy, technical director, I'm Scott. We're past our prime. <laughs>